Welcome to Magic by Design. We are off to early 20th century America this week with Disney's 15th animated feature, Lady and the Tramp. If you're new to our show, we are aiming to watch and review every Disney animated feature film. Each week we break down a movie from the Disney canon in an attempt to discover the secrets behind the magic. But before we dive into another Disney classic, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Ken, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host slash brother Garrett. Gar, how are you? Is Lady in the Tramp not set in France? No, maybe you're thinking of Ratatouille. No, I'm definitely thinking of Lady in the Tramp. I always thought it was set in France. What did I think it was set in France, Ken? Explain it to me. I don't know. Have you seen it before this? No, but I suppose the pasta scene, which you should I, that should make me think, oh, it's Italy, it's pasta. But like the pasta scene is also all those scored with that like classic French music, isn't it? I don't think it's French music, but maybe it's reminiscent of French music. Yeah, I don't know. So I'm, brain? I'm googling Lady in the Tramp in France and there, there's other people that also think it's set in France so this is not a me thing perhaps it's like the Berenstein Bear thing the bear the Baron Berenstein Bears or the Berenstein Bears it's spelt differently or something isn't yeah, it yeah but everyone thinks it's one way when it's actually the other yeah it's it's the world. The world is a scary place and obviously there's a lady in the uh, lady in the tramp set in Paris in another alternate timeline which I'm actually from and I've slipped into this timeline and that's how I think it's always set in Paris. Are you from a different universe? Yes. How do I tell? You're an idiot. Oh, oh, right. That's oh, normal. That's, that's normal, girl. <laughs> For me, again, I, I talk about living memory. I may have seen this when I was small, but I, I don't recall much of it except the iconic scene. Which I know the pasta. spaghetti scene. Yeah, everyone knows that scene. Yeah, that's, that's as I said, we'll, we'll talk about legacy in a minute. That's the scene everybody knows. Yeah. The rest of the film, no, no, no. I don't even like have a reference point for the Tramp character design. I thought he looked different. So there, like, there's me. Yeah, I'm not quite that bad, but I, I don't. It's not one of those ones I think of watching outside of this project. I didn't watch the Disney Plus remake either. No, the uh, dogs look weird. I don't like it. It has that uncanny valley quality, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just like look at us real dogs that aren't real dogs. And like one thing, but they're we, real dogs, but they CG their eyes to look more human, and it's just really weird. And like, in fairness, one thing, Lady and the Tramp. They the animated film does. I guess the other one is animated too. This, this thing is live action. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's still like super animated. But one thing the animated film does is I think it, it really does try to represent dogs as dogs. Yeah, I have that as a note here later on. We'll talk about that. But it does, you know, it do, it's not quite Zootopia. It's not like, you know, uh, a, an animal world, but it's showing us the world that we live in from the point of view of the dog, which I really appreciate. Yeah, the, like, obviously the dogs talk, so that's something dogs can't do, I don't think. But the way dogs behave is very, like, true to dogs. Like, when you close the door on them, they always do a little pat at the door, being like, let me back in, and stuff like that. It's like, oh, that's, like, little dog behaviour. They didn't overly anthropomorphize the dogs, which I appreciate. Yeah. They're still dogs. They behave like dogs, but they have character. I think that's really good. Like, there's one scene early on where they bring Lady home, and they're, they're leaving her alone for the first time, and she starts whimpering and pawing, and that's exactly what my dog did. Yeah, tortured she, was, she literally whined so loud for, like, a whole night, and my girlfriend got really annoyed. She's like, I love you, but I hate you. <laughs> you have to stay alone. Did you give in? Did you let her in? No, we didn't. So your your monsters, unlike uh, the family and the lady in the tramp, which I don't think actually have names. They have no. John Boy and Darling, which is also another like little dog touch. I like that the dogs know them by like the the pet names they have for one another, not their real names. Not John Boy, it's Jim Deer. Same, same thing. John Boy yeah. is a Peter Pan character. <laughs> no, it's the Waltons. There we go. I know the Waltons. I've never seen the Waltons. What's the Waltons? Why do I know a reference from the Waltons? It's like a family, and they're in the olden times in the South. And they they run a, a sawmill, I think. Why do I make reference to something I've never seen? You've probably seen Goodnight, John Boy. Probably. Yeah. You're a John Boy. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm Ken Boy. You're a Ken doll. If your nickname is anything, it's Ken doll. Yeah. Haven't heard that before. You haven't heard that before? Yeah. Who's, who's, who's called you Ken doll? Well, they don't say Ken doll, but they're like, oh, Barbie and Ken. <laughs> and like, they always laugh as if they're the first person to say it. I'm like, I'm 31 years old. <laughs> I've heard this before. Diving into the, a bit of background here, Gar, recently we're seeing a, a release every year, and we're moving away from this now. 
like there's two years between our last film Peter Pan and this and there's four years between this and the next film which is Sleeping Beauty which we'll talk about next week which is yeah, they're like let's actually try for these and like a, a, a big part of that probably is a point you're probably about to bring up is that this is their first self-distributed animated film yes so the pressure to churn them out which probably came a little from RKO is like we need a Disney film this year hey get working whereas now they're distributing their own films so they're like we don't need to rush these things out because we don't need to meet somebody else's schedule so that's why they probably were, were more willing to, to let them go there are a few reasons for this actually uh, as you know during the war there was a lot of films in production that were shelved so they all went back into production so they were half finished or they might have had like various stages of development so they all kind of came to fruition more or less the same time that's where we're seeing a film every year but also the studio was being more financially prudent as we've talked about in recent weeks they're not throwing good money after bad they're being a bit more careful about how they produce things disney's efforts were also focused in multiple areas now such as live action features and disneyland which was to open the same year and as you said, Garrett, the, the, they're making more effort. The, the the productions are more sophisticated and elaborate, so they, they take more time. Yeah, and there's no external pressure because they're making all the money off these films now. They don't have to split anything with RKO. They have their own distribution chain. Lady and the Tramp was released to theatres on June 22nd, 1955, shortly after our, our own father was born. He's 65 this year. Shortly before. Oh, so before. Sorry, I was thinking of May. For some reason, that's Ed. Is yeah. it, is don't it? know when your own father is born. That's Ed Jr. Sorry. Uh, we're talking about Ed Senior here. Uh, it had box office success. In fact, it was the highest grossing Disney film since Snow White, Ooh. since the beginning. Dogs. Dogs are draws, clearly. It initially received mixed to negative reviews from critics, but critical reception for the film has improved over time, and most people in modern times consider it one of the best Disney films. That's it's an interesting trend, that even the ones that weren't well-received at the time are now looked back as uh, on classics, which probably speaks less to their quality than like the strength of the Disney brand and it's like everything we produce are classics we've yeah. never made a bad film in our lives they have that PR machine that is relentless Lady and the Tramp is one of the best films you've ever seen is it? eh but <laughs> critics at the time called it one of Disney's worst in terms of animation no it's I, not I, this I, film is very pretty it, it's very pretty I disagree with this and I would explain why there's, in, there's in the, like, in the, in the, uh, we have the animation coming up but I, we, I'll go into that but I, I completely disagree I don't super love this film but one thing this film is is very pretty yeah. get out of here it's also widescreen which is weird uh, you, you know what it there are moving into the animation they captured the movement and behavior of dogs really well and as they had done with bambi with the deers the animators studied many breeds of dogs to capture the movement and personality so you really see that coming across successfully on the screen and it's a little hokey but i like the fact that all the dogs have the different accents of the the, yeah. the, the source of their breed so like there's a scotty named jock and he has a scottish accent and there's a, a bulldog and a, a, I don't remember his name, but he has an English accent and, yeah, and so on and so forth. German dogs and American dogs. Yeah, it's like, it's a nice touch. There's a lot of accents in this film. There's a lot of accents in this film. And some of them are, are less successful than others. Ooh, yes, the Siamese cats. Ooh, but yeah, we'll get on to that. I thought, one thing I have a note here as well, Baby Lady was adorable. A, a very accurate depiction of a new puppy as well, as I said. The, mm. the, the mannerisms and the, the actions and the, the worries. Dogs have worries, Gar. I, I found that out through a study. Really? Not from your own dog? I don't have a dog because I don't trust dogs. Because all animals does have a worried trusted, face. Because they'll, they'll, they'll revolt against us and take us down eventually. But uh, that's the reason you should never trust dogs. They will, they'll have their coup. And they, honestly, they probably deserve the earth. Come on, look what, look what we've done to it. But until then... They can't be trusted. Uh, but yeah, your dog. Look at her and her big, dumb, worried face. And she she always scratches at the door when she's left alone. She uh, thinks, like, that's it forever now. They've, they've abandoned me. No one's ever going back until the next morning when someone opens the door and she's free again. And she does the same thing every night. And yeah, stupid dogs. Dogs are stupid. But their stupidity is funny. Yeah, they are very funny. She also has nightmares. You can you can tell she makes a, a little bloop bloop noise when she's having nightmares. Yes, she she does make a weird noise because like in this film, uh, the 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 which the, the dog with the thing the smelling problem. What's his name? Uh, trusty, trusty, trusty has nightmares in this film. Uh, in this film, and he 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 does like the standard dog whimpering. Whereas when your dog has way on nightmares, she's like whoop whoop. Whoop! It's yeah. like, what are you doing over there? It's such a weird noise, and we don't know for sure, but we imagine because it only happens when she, she's asleep. She's sleeping, yeah, and not always when she's sleeping. Only certain times when she's sleeping. So it's like, oh, you're having nightmares there, or you have like a respiratory problem, which uh, hopefully it's not that. Well, she's mentioned a vet, and they didn't flag anything. Fingers crossed. We we, we recently insured her, so they'll they'll cover us if, if anything is wrong. But uh, yeah, so maybe she ha- she's having drowning dreams, and that's the reason she has she's making like bubble noises. Who knows? They they dream about anything and. Everything. Everything. Abandonment. Drowning. Food. 
No food? That's a nightmare. It's probably mostly food. It's probably mostly what dogs dream about. One of the things I noted, Gary, I don't know if you picked this up, Lady is painted kind of differently to the rest of the characters. She's painted very softly with kind of soft lines, where the others, especially the male characters, have kind of very scruffy outlines or very hard black lines. That's reinforcing gender stereotypes. Though if that was an intent to uh, make Lady seem pampered and like very, you know, she's a home dog as opposed to Tramp, who is a street-wise tough dog, that's a, a nice contrast if that's the intent. Yeah, that was my reading of it. Mm. Uh, as you said, it's a very pretty film there's some nice transitions showing the passage of time before the baby comes like the houses are really beautifully painted yeah there's like wide shots of the neighborhood that are just absolutely lovely like they're they're extremely p- p- picturesque as i can't say words that makes sense as well because to dogs the house is the whole world that is their universe yes so like it makes sense that they're emphasized and they're shown in, in, in granular detail which is the reason they love to go for walks because it's like look at the rest of the world originally the background artist was supposed to be mary blair who's a legendary background artist at Disney, but she left to become a children's illustrator for, mm. for, for children's books in 1953. She illustrated anything we know? No, uh, I didn't see in my research. I should have looked more into it, but uh, I didn't mention it. Claude Coates was then appointed as the key background artist. Coates made models of the interiors of Jim Deere and Darling's house, and he also shot photos and film from a low perspective as reference to maintain a dog's view. So all the houses are seen from a, a dog's view. Another thing we mentioned, but I also appreciate it. But like the houses, it's just it's really pretty. It's like a painting. It's like a but impressionistic kind of well not impressionistic because it's not like loose in detail it's, it's just painterly yeah. and it really makes the characters pop against it it's really vibrant it's really nice it's like really nice to look at as I mentioned, it's in widescreen, which for at first I was like, wait a minute, is this a re-release version? Because the version on Disney Plus is a widescreen version, as opposed to the, the standard 4x3 version of the, the prior films. But this is the first film they, they filmed in widescreen, so there you go. It's, that's true, and apparently it's very problematic because they had to issue two reels of the film eventually, because obviously, as you might tell, some cinemas were not set up to show this new format. Yes. And they had to scramble to get another cut in, in, the, in the standard or more acceptable format at the time. Yeah, so uh, like everything was released in 4x3 so everyone was, everything was as 4x3 TVs at the time as limited as they would have been in the, in the 1950s would all have been 4x3 and they would have been 4x3 until the late 90s when they, when when like widescreen screen didn't, didn't become an acceptable format not an acceptable format but a, a common uh, widespread format until the 90s so think about how long that took 35 years it wasn't really until HD came along that we're like maybe we should switch all these things from squares to rectangles and that's that's how that happened but one interesting note here as well, Gar. Although the spaghetti eating sequence is now probably the most well-known scene in the film, Walt Disney was prepared to cut it, thinking it would not be romantic to have dogs eating spaghetti. He thought it would look silly. Oh, Walt is stupid. Animator Frank Thomas was against Walt's decision and took it upon himself to animate the entire scene himself without any layouts, so he just did it. Walt was impressed by Thomas's work and how he romanticized the scene and kept it in. That's an interesting thing. Like, Walt Disney's starting to lose touch with animation here because he's distracted. But also, I I don't think, you know, we've talked about this over time. Like, Disney films with less of his influence tend to work out better. It's not that he doesn't have, you know, it's been well documented that he's a great story man and he has great ideas. But, you know, in a creative process, you can't just have one person making all the decisions. Yes, it can't be a singular vision. And that singular vision isn't always right. Because, like, Walt Disney has a certain style and certain tastes. But, like, his tastes clearly don't apply to the film about the romantic dogs because he doesn't get it. And if he doesn't get it, he's never going to make the right creative choices for it. It's the what I call the Vince McMahon problem. <laughs> where he doesn't like the things that he has in front of him. So of course he makes bad creative choices about it because he doesn't like it. Or he doesn't understand. Yeah, so that's, that seems similar to late uh, late era Disney animation with Walt Disney, where like, the dog movie, I just want to make princesses. And then he looks at the dog movie, it's like, dogs can't eat spaghetti romantically. They're dogs. Whereas they do the little put it in the mouth and they kiss and it's like, ah! <laughs> and he nuzzles over the meatball to give her the last one because yeah. he's showing his affection. It's genius. Frank Thomas, uh, a pioneer and probably one of the best animators of all time. Smarter than Walt Disney. Moving on here to the story and the themes. This is based on the 1945 Cosmopolitan magazine story of Happy Dan, the Cynical Dog by Ward Green. Which I couldn't find, by the way. I I looked for it. I was going to ask you, did you read it? No, but you tried. So we'll give you a a, a C- this week. I didn't look like super hard, but I googled it and it didn't come up on the first page. So that's that's me off the hook. I should have tried to dig up the original copy of the Cosmopolitan magazine and been like, Ah, I spent two grand on this copy with the lady in the tram. You'll probably find it somewhere, maybe in their archives. In 1937, 
children, Disney story artist Joe Grant came up with an idea inspired by the antics of his English Springer Spaniel, uh, Lady, same name. In, in, a, in the film, though, it's an American one, I think, American Springer Spaniel. Yes. I'm not sure what the difference is. Accents, uh, apparently, according yeah. to this film. He had a brainwave when he noticed how she got shoved aside by Joe's new babies. You know, it's a classic story. We see it in, in live action and animation all the time now. But, you know, the dog is the baby, essentially. And then the baby comes along and the dog is jealous. Or It's just like, our really, because I was born after you and you hated me as a child. <laughs> so, like, it, that trend has not discontinued. <laughs> I am to uh, the baby uh, as uh, to a lady as you are to me. There we go. There, that, that, I bungled that. But you get the point. There's a photo of us sitting in a bath where, you look, where you're look. you looking at me looking like you want to murder me. It's very funny. We'll, we'll post that on the internet. No, we won't. We're actually nude in that photo. Full, full deaths there. Yes, we are very naked babies. We should not put that out in public. But you, you want to murder me. Grant approached Walt Disney with sketches of Lady. And Disney enjoyed the sketches. So he commissioned Grant to start a story development on a new feature entitled Lady. Through the late 30s and early 40s, Grant and other artists worked on the story, taking a, a variety of approaches, but Disney wasn't pleased with any of them. He thought Lady was too sweet and there was not enough action. You see, that's actually one of the things I like about this film, that there's not a ton of action. This film feels more like modern in terms of its willingness to just tell the story it wants to tell. And it's not like, oh, we need an action set piece. We need this. We need that. It's like, it's it's a relatively slow paced film. Like, what's the emotional, there's an emotional climax which involves chase facing a, a carrot going to the pound, but that's that's about it. And a rat trying to murder a baby, because apparently that's what rats do. Rats <laughs> yeah. sneak into rooms and it's like, baby was, murder child. That was a nice piece of foreshadowing I didn't pick up, because we see that rat in the beginning when Lady is a puppy, and she chases him, him off, and I was like, oh, that was a bit emphasised. I wonder why that was. And he comes back in the end, and Lady is chained up outside because Aunt Sarah comes along and hates dogs. Yes. So uh, She is like me. She does try- not trust them. She's trying to get in. in does she trust cats, cats as well, though? So, that's- so the, the rat goes into the room, and by all accounts, they thought the rat would kill the baby? Yes. I don't know. But apparently, the, bat- the rat got as far as the crib and was, like, menacingly standing over the crib. So that rat was going for that baby. He's that like, rat is a baby murderer. Chase me away, away will you, lady? <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to kill this baby. That's equal. <laughs> of course, uh, try to, you pointed out, Tramp fought off three dogs in this film by, by himself, because Tramp's a badass. But also, he couldn't beat a rat. Like, he had a knockdown, drag him out fight with a rat. Come on, Tramp. That's unrealistic storytelling, 1950s Disney. Yeah, I don't hit that. It's like, you can fight off three large dogs, but a rat? Maybe it's a special rat gear. It might be a special... It is a special baby murderer rat. So maybe when the rat murders babies, which I assume it's done before, because it, it had a very practiced uh, MO, as they say, <laughs> in the crime world. <laughs> so what you're saying is the rat maybe consumes the baby and absorbs its power? Something like that, yes. This rat has done this before. Walt Disney read the short story by Ward Green, as we uh, noted called Happy Dan the Cynical Dog and thought that Grant's story would be improved if Lady fell in love with a cynical dog character like the one in Green's story and bought the rights to it. So it's actually a combination of an existing property with an original story. So it's combining those two elements together. That's why it's... Why isn't it called Lady and Happy Dan the Cynical Dog? <laughs> it's a bit long, that title. It doesn't roll off the tongue. If it's one thing about the title, it, it is an iconic Lady and the Tramp. It's just, it just evokes a certain... I personally memory. think it should have been called Lady and Happy Dan the Cynical Dog. Well, Gary, you're probably in the minority there. Lady and Happy Dan the Cynical Dog, too. The Cynical Dog, uh, later called the Tramp, had several names in drawing development, including Homer... Rags and a bozo. It's interesting how like the the entire idea of of Tramp was that he would go to different families and have different names for those families. Yeah, and somehow the, the number of names he had, none of those were the names that even those families gave him. There was uh, can't remember any of the names. There was like bo bo. Boxer, nah. Mickey, Mickey for the Irish family. Yeah, there were stereotypical names based on like where he was going. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, impressions in this movie that are very uh, stereotypical and possibly even racist. Yeah, I was like when I saw when I was opening the film on Disney Plus, there was the, this film contains outdated cultural depictions thing. And I was like, what cultural depictions could there be in a film about dogs? And then the Siamese cats show up, and you're like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, they're incredibly racist. And I find them very creepy. Well, they're meant to be creepy, but that's part of the problematic thing that these cats who are meant to be Chinese are... Siamese. Yes, but that's the word Is that China? I don't know, but I think it's just meant to be a word play. The finished film is actually slightly different from what was originally planned. Lady was to have 
only one next door neighbour, a Ralph Bellamy type canine named Hubert. Hubert was later replaced by Jock and Trusty, which I thought was a good move. I liked their combination. My bad. Siamese cats are native to Thailand, apparently. Uh, well, that shows my ignorance then. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, like, the, the one thing in life, Ken, is to always assume you're a dumbass and then everything's fine. And it's not like we can't Google things these days before we open our stupid mouths. <laughs> uh, you're meant to do the research for these things. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm talent. I just show up and talk. You're meant to do the deep research and have, here's the deep history of Siamese cats and culture. So, uh, and I can bounce off of that instead of just like what's a cat oh it's Chinese but yes very stereotypically Asian representation of it and the song is just oh god yeah I'll talk about the song in a minute but I, I, the Siamese cats are total assholes they wreck the gaff and then try to eat the pet fish and then they pin it on Lady mm. which results in her getting muzzled and later put outside when they get her back don't the cats consider eating the baby at one stage too uh, not, not eating the baby they want to steal the baby's milk I think oh so they're, they're jerks Aunt Sarah, uh, we talked about Aunt Sarah, was to be a traditional mother-in-law who was overbearing. In the final film, she softened into a busybody who, though... Softened? Is, really? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 this is what they say, softened. I didn't think she was too soft. Though she was antagonistic towards Lady and the Tramp, she is well-meaning. She just wants no, she's to, not. She, she just wants to look after the baby. Sure. Uh, she even sends a packet of dog biscuits to the dogs at Christmas to apologise for mistreating them. Apparently, you can see a present from her under the tree for the dog. I did not catch that when I watched the film. No, that's her, that's her big baby face turn. It's a very subtle storytelling. The rat, who we spoke about earlier, was somewhat of a comedic character in early sketches, but became a great deal more frightening due to the need to raise dramatic tension. The rat is the villain of the film. <laughs> there are several villains we have. Aunt Sarah, we have uh, the rat, but we also have the dog catcher. One thing I really liked as well, there was this motif of every time the dog catcher came round, he was whistling that tune, oh where, oh where has my little dog gone? Mm. So like, it was foreshadowing the danger. So like, right before Lady gets captured by the dog catcher, you hear him whistling and he's around. So I thought that was really neat. But also you were like, oh, all dog catchers are cynical, horrible dog catcher people and animated things that just want to capture dogs. And it's like... Well, they are in like, most depictions. They're like, oh, I don't care if this dog has an owner, I'm just going to destroy it. Whereas they weren't here. It's like, oh, there's a caller we gotta find the owners <laughs> it's like we brought her home a nice piece of Disney trivia here and I, I found this out in the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco I've talked about that a few times if you're ever there really go and check it out once museums reopen of course it's it's a really great experience and, and it's uh, a great day out the film's opening sequence I'll get to my point now here sorry in which Darling unwraps a hat box on Christmas morning to find Lady inside is inspired by an incident when Walt Disney presented his wife Lily with a chow puppy as a gift in a hat box to make up for previously forgetting a dinner date oh that's nice. That's cute. It's a nice piece of trivia. Uh, apparently, Jim Deere and Darling also had names in the past, but they decided to change it to make it again from a dog's perspective. The dog doesn't know the names of the of the family; they just know what they hear. Yeah. So, like, obviously, she says Jim Darling when she's calling him. Uh, uh, Jim Deere. Sorry. <laughs> Turn about fair play. Now I've corrected you on it. Yeah, sorry, Gar. I, I apologize for my earlier jibes. She she says Jim Deer when she's calling him, and he calls her darling. So that's what she thinks their names are, and I think that's very cute. Yes, I think, that, as I said, the, the depiction of dogs in this is obviously not that, again, they talk. Dogs don't talk. But do they have dogs talk to each other? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's like Toy Story. They talk when we're not around. Maybe they do. Maybe Honey is like, he's that Ken guy. He's a jerk. And she says that all the time. Honey is Ken's dog, by the way. I don't think we actually named her earlier. Honey the Chihuahua. Yeah. But yeah, the depiction of dogs is pretty famous for the dogs I like that I think that's why it appeals to people because everyone they see their dog in the film yeah, yeah you yeah. see the behaviour of your dog in the film it's like, that's like my, my dog, dog does that yeah and you know most people are dog lovers except you Monsters. one note I have here Gard during the spaghetti thing, can dogs slurp spaghetti do they have the ability they don't really have lips so can they like go can they pucker and go <sighs> Sorry for that awful noise, listeners. I'm very sorry. I just yeah, need to well, illustrate it. I know from your dog, when we we drop pasta shells on the floor and she tries to eat it, she can't. <laughs> like, she no. cannot get through pasta. She's like, I cannot chew this. And you're like, get it out of your mouth, you dumb dog. She's like, yeah, I can get So I doubt they can slurp pasta. <laughs> No, so that maybe that was a bit unrealistic. Unrealistic. But they made talking it, dogs eating dinner. But they made it as realistic as they could. And freaking lady at the end of the film is just like, go, go get him. I need to save my, my friend. And uh, uh, Jim Deere is like, yes, I understand. We must drive after the dog. Lady convinces Jim Deere to speed off in a, in a, a taxi after the pound wagon. Mm-hmm. So like she manages to convince, to, she, she manages like, they're like, 
she's, she's trying to tell us something so they race upstairs and like there was a rat I get that but at least I understand that because she was barking and she ran upstairs to the thing but the like running out is like we must get a taxi and follow the dog thing well Jim Deere felt bad because they sent the, the tramp off to his death even though he was trying to defend the baby mm. so he wanted to go and rescue him uh, another note here like this is a cause of tension in the movie the tramp is a total fuck <laughs> boy like so a lady is like oh I'm falling in love with this guy and he seems really nice and I think we're, we're meant to be together and he, he hears that tramp is a, a womanizer he's been with several girls like Trixie and uh, I like the way you only remember Trixie because it was the name of our neighbor's dog yeah I, there was a Mexican dog uh, and you think I'd be good at Mexican dogs because I have a Mexican dog yes but I, I can't remember but yeah he's a somewhat of a womanizer and sleeps uh, around sleeps around but he's, a, he's an opportunist and I think that's his character so like, he's living the street life Ken that's the street life it's fun and fancy free because yeah. it's, it's a Disney film he'll take affection and food where he can get it but then he actually falls for somebody and he's like oh no she found out about my womanizing ways I must earn her trust back by fighting this rat this really overpowered rat for some reason one thing I noticed here towards the end of the film, it kind of struck me. I think it's my last point on the story here, Gar. The story of Lady and the Tramp really mirrors the story of Toy Story 4. Uh, I guess. You know the way, obviously we know that Woody knows Bo Peep, but mm. Bo Peep is like, I don't need a, an owner anymore. I'm out here on the street. I can provide for myself. I'm freer. My life is better. Where Lady is obviously a house dog, as we said, and is used to the human world and the tramp has forsaken that because he doesn't trust it he thinks that he's better off by himself and he tries to convince lady that the same so the, same also, the, the reason lady wants to go back is she wants to protect the baby and so the reason uh, Woody wants uh, to go back is he wants to protect Bonnie. Well, Molly yeah so. Bonnie same thing it's not the same thing I learned Toy Story so overall I thought in terms of a story like it's it's not very sophisticated but as you said like it's not a movie about nothing but it's nice to follow a kind of a simple story as it unfolds through the eyes of a dog dog's like stakes aren't that high but it's just it's nice to follow their their lives as they interact with the human world and that, like they see it differently than we would which i thought was it was nice yeah like i consider this a dumbo tier film one of the ones that is like perfectly good but really nothing special you know yeah. it's like oh this is an enjoyable film but it wouldn't be that like, looks really nice yeah it looks very pretty like one of my five notes on this film is very pretty uh so yeah like it, it wouldn't be in my top tier disney films i think it's certainly worth watching i think it's a, a a good story well told but it's not like the best story you'll ever see in your life it's not the the most dramatic film it's not the funniest film it's not the you know it's not the one of the most like uh, uh, thrilling films but it's an enjoyable film that sits in its existence with those dogs for the majority of the film that's what the majority of the film is like there's very little dramatic tension for most of the film and that's fine I, I like it that way because like usually ramping up dramatic tension in a story like this involves adding plot elements that just like ruin the film and, and, and stuff that dogs and cats can't do yeah you'll end up having freaking tramp do backflips through windows or something I don't know how we would add drama but or driving a car or something like that <laughs> But yeah, I, I like just sitting with these dog characters and learning their lives and then learning their problems and learning their loves and their falling outs and they could live happily ever after. It's a simple story. It's well told. Is it the best story? No. Is it the worst story? No. Is it enjoyable? Yes. I, I'd agree, Gar. I'd say give it a watch because like, it's a nice way to spend 80 minutes. Mm, 75. Oh, sorry, Gar. 75 minutes. Uh, in terms of the, the final thoughts and legacy about this film, I had some notes about the music, but as you know, Nicole covers that very well and I, mm-hmm. I have to say i've listened to her segment she sent it to me earlier and we're in for a treat this week with the song it's a, a very jazzy version and it's really nice uh we'll talk about that in a minute quickly on the songs i had a couple of notes before we kind of give our final thoughts on the legacy of this we've given our final thoughts but we'll talk about the legacy of this film um the song followed a jazz format which i really enjoyed there wasn't too many songs but yeah. i enjoyed it <laughs> the, 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 the songs were mostly kind of jazz-esque in like, like there's ladies song that she sings to herself which is barely even a song no, it's more of a uh, it's a couple of bars thinking out loud <laughs> yeah in, in, in rhythm but uh, there's the We Have Siamese Cat song which, you know, which I have here gives me the heebie-jeebies yes and um, yeah it's about it no there's another song what's the third the other song Bella Noche oh the Can They Feel the Loves of Tonight song oh yes I forgot about that in the story like there's like uh, like Bambi and the Lion King there's like a wandering around together falling in love to a song they freaking love that don't they they love that like so that sequence is to the song Bella Note which is a lovely song but like that that trope is evident in a lot of Disney films uh, the score is fairly standard nothing special here again not really focused on that much it's a standard kind of you know ebbs and flow kind of score uh, yeah like, as, I, as I said Nicole does it much more justice at the end in terms of the legacy of this film yeah, we've kind of touched on some of those points here it's the first animated film produced using the cinemascope widescreen process Mm-hmm. Uh, the spaghetti scene has been imitated and spoofed ad nauseum in pop culture. You see that 
uh, even to this day. Yeah, the the iconic moment from this film. In a way that, like, I, remember I was like, Alice doesn't really have an iconic moment, and what was the last one we watched? Peter Pan doesn't even really have a single iconic well, the, moment. The, the, the Big Ben moment, and they're flying around London, I think that's the one that sticks out for me. Yeah, but whereas the, the, but like in, in terms of like a, a cult of something on a cultural level, I don't think Peter Pan had something that's seeped into that level. As I said, like Pinocchio's nose or like Dumbo's ears. Uh, whereas this does. The kissing scene does. The spaghetti. And like most of these films, a live action adaptation premiered on Disney Plus in 2019. I, I, we still haven't watched it. No, I don't like it. Looks weird. Yeah, it looks a bit too uncanny valley to me, as I said. So that's it. Lady and the Tramp. Nice to look at. Nice, simple story. Nothing that's going to blow your mind or, or challenge you too much, but it's a great afternoon or evening's viewing. Yes, in our case, late night viewing. Yes, to, to be ready for this podcast. Okay, ladies and tramps, that's nearly it for the show this week. Our resident musical lady, Nicole, is coming up in just a few moments with a song from Lady and the Tramp. It's a really good one this week, as I said, so be sure to stick around for that after the outro. You can find new episodes of Magic by Design every Monday, where all magical podcasts are downloaded. Check out the website at magicbydesign.buzzsprout.com to find a full list of podcast providers. Magic by Design is also on all your favourite social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash magicbydesignpod, on Twitter at magicdesignpod, and on the Insta at magicbydesignpod. Last week we posted some really neat photos for the Peter Pan production so it's, it's worth checking out woo go follow us on Twitter yeah if you listen to our podcast if you listen this far you clearly want to follow us on Twitter of course if you're a fan of the show please do consider giving us a positive review on your podcast platform of choice share this share the podcast on your socials or recommend the show to a fellow Disney lover we want our podcast to be a thoroughbred not a mongrel and every review helps Ken we- is a, a dog elitist yes I have a purebred dog uh, <laughs> that was bought. I didn't rescue it and I'm a monster. We will be back next week at the same time, same place with Disney's 16th animated feature, Sleeping Beauty. But until then, stay safe and remember, when you're foot loose and collar free, you take nothing but the best. Now then, we are off to the jazz club now because Nicole is here to sing us out with He's a Tramp from Lady and the Tramp, no less, as well as some fun facts about the music of the film. Take it away, Nicole. Hi, Disney friends. This is your musical correspondent, Nicole, coming to you live from my bedroom. This week, we're looking at the original Lady in the Tramp movie. I really loved this movie as a kid, but enough about me. The musical score was composed by Oliver Wallace, his last score for Disney. Popular jazz recording artist Peggy Lee wrote a number of the songs for the film with Sonny Burke, including La La Lou, the Siamese Cat Song, which is omitted from the 2019 live-action film, and He's a Tramp. Peggy also voiced the characters of Peganese Peg and the twin Siamese cats C and M. In a dramatic turn of events, Peggy sued Walt Disney in 1988 for breach of contract for the use of music transcriptions in the video release of the movie. In 1991, she won the claim and got $2.3 million. Disney learned from this mistake. Now, its standard contractual language requires that artists surrender rights to their work for exploitation in all media now known or hereafter devised. This week, I'm channeling my inner jazz songstress, saying he's a trap. I hope you enjoy it. He's a trap. But they love him Breaks a new heart Every day He's a trend They adore him And I only hope He'll stay that way He's a trend He's a scoundrel He's a rounder He's a cat He's a trend But I love him Yes but I have got it pretty bad You can never tell when he'll show up He gives you plenty of trouble I guess he's just a no-count pup But I wish that he were double He's a tramp He's a rover And there's nothing more to say If he's a tramp, he's a good one 
And I wish that I could travel his way Wish that I could travel his way Wish that I could travel his way